Welcome to vlog number six from Quality Chess. I'm Jakob. I'm Nikos. And uh, today I wanted to look at uh, two of the endings from uh, the World Championship. Um, the first one was where Carlton missed a win in game three. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to go deeply into it, but uh, I just wanted to briefly uh, show the win. Uh, because I thought it was was very nice. So he in the position he played rook b7. Let's ignore that. Uh, we will always put a PGN up uh, with the chess. You can check it there. There will be more details. But the winning line is rook f7. Check, and it's to to uh, get the king away. So there's no uh, no chance of um, of mating threats. So if uh, black, for example, plays king e6, which is one of the lines I looked at. Then uh, rook f2 is the winning move here. And if you just put in the moves, we'll see what happens here. So h3, main move, king h4, h2, and rook a2. I just thought that was really beautiful. The main thing is just avoiding rook a1, and next move, king h3, and then attack the pawn, take the pawn. And there, there. And it wins in the long run. King g2, king takes h2, and uh, and black won't win the b3 pawn, and uh, it'll probably take some time for white to untangle himself. Um, you, you could you could I could you could imagine he could still blow it. Um, I think, for example, if you play king d4 here with black, I think rook c2 should be a winning move. Uh, I didn't analyze this, but I was just seeing it now. Uh, the idea is uh, rook a1, you have knight c6, check. And uh, followed by king takes h2, uh, maybe with knight takes b4, check uh, first. So anyway, you can you can see my analysis in the, in the PGN, and, uh, and you can check it for yourself. Um, I didn't see this win anywhere, but I'm sure that someone else also found it because it's uh, we all use the same tools. So, um, but the more interesting point I wanted to uh, to talk about was game nine. If we can go to game nine, Nikas. Um, so in this position here, <clears throat> I also uh, I, I looked at it a bit. Uh, I looked at it live, um, and like everyone else, I was thinking. 25 minutes to make two moves. You just decide on one and then you make the next. Kayaking was thinking for a long time. And like everyone else, I thought rather than bishop takes f7, which uh, we can just show the, the first few moves to position simplifies, rather than this in d5 here, okay, let's stop after d5. Rather than uh, one move back, rather than, uh, than this position here, d5. Stop after d5. So rather than uh, you know trying this, which turns out that Carson thought for a bit and, and found a way to neutralize it, I was thinking like everyone else that he would play queen b3. But we just see black played knight f5. Yeah, bishop c3, king f8, take, 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 take. And um, yeah, it's a little bit annoying for uh, for black. But ultimately, Carlsen held it without any big difficulty. So we can look at Queen B3, which which I thought was was going to win as well, because and and this is embarrassing, but uh, I'll say this: it is as I was looking at the engine as well. Uh, and I was talking uh, during the game with uh, Sam Shanklin, um, and he was saying, "No, no, no, I don't think it's going to win." Um, and actually, his reasoning was slightly wrong, but his logic was right. So queen b3, black should play knight f5, and then take an f7. And then if you read, for example, go back here, uh, make the most when I ask. So when uh, you look at Kawana's um, annotations on chess base, for example, you see that people are following the first line of the computer just. but. Computers are not very good at fortresses, and they're not very good at what we call pre-theoretical endings. So positions where a theoretical ending is about to arise, uh, but doesn't arise by force. And, and we'll see clearly what I mean here in the line. So black shouldn't play king g7 as the engine says, he should take. Queen takes f7, exchange, 
take h7 and king e6 and rook c7 and here uh, Sam said, and then knight d4, and uh, after bishop c3, rook d1, take take on d4, you get a, a rook end game where white has two f pawns and will exchange one of them for the g pawn if he's uh, successful. And then we get rook and f and h and a draw position. This is what I say, uh, like a pre theoretical ending. We don't have a theoretical ending yet. Uh, it cannot use this uh, table basis, so it thinks white has a huge advantage. Uh, but in reality, it's probably just draw. But I just want to show that knight d4 doesn't actually work. Um, so knight d4, then rook g7. And then defending the pawn can be quite difficult here. For example, uh, king f6, bishop c3, and uh, we're just over, so therefore king f5. And again, bishop c3. And now it's just a bad fork, yeah. So if uh, rook d1, rook d7, and if rook a4, then rook f7 check. And rook f4. You could also play king g5 and, and h4 check, I think. Uh, or maybe even bishop d2 check is mate. Bishop d2 check is mate. So, okay. So anyway, so after rook takes c7, um, Black had to find a, a slightly nicer way. So uh, knight h4 might work, but also I looked at the line here, rook d1. And again, I will just say that the details will be in the PTN. There will be more details than we'll be giving here. Um, so let's let's run the variation. So we have bishop c3, which is not the strongest, uh, but it has a, a very nice line, knight d4, rook g7. And this is almost the same position as before. Almost the same position. Uh, but there's a difference, knight e2. And uh, we see that uh, we're threatening currently knight f4 check, followed by knight h5 check. And the draw would be absolutely immediate. So, uh, so white has to try something. So let's try uh, take rook g6. And king d7 check back again. Okay, he can go to c7, and then check. No, oh, sorry, bishop c1, rook, there, check. King h3, and rook g5. I like this move. Yes, it attacks the bishop, but more importantly, it's uh, threatening uh, knight g1, f3, perpetual. And uh, so the question is, of course, how much did Kayak can see? Uh, if we can get him to be a guest on the vlog, we will definitely ask him. Uh, but I, I think we will uh, maybe aim uh, slightly lower um, for 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 uh, early guests. Um, so so th this was the chess content I had. Um, what, do, what do you think of the World Championship so far? Uh, first of all, I would like to make a comment. We talked about the fortress in the last vlog, and uh, I remember you telling me that. In your book, uh, Endgame, uh, about the Endgame, you did uh, a lot of work on the fortresses. Yeah, I, uh, I'll just see if I have it here. Yep. Here we go. I always, oh, John will always like this, you know. Uh, where, where am I? Where's the camera? There, Endgame Play. Grandmaster Preparation, uh, Volume 5. I'm writing on Volume 6 at the moment which will be out next year. Um, yes, I, uh, I came to a realization that there is essentially only two techniques of, uh, of defense. I may be oversimplifying it, but there are essentially two methods of defense. There's either active play or there is uh, fortress thinking. So basically, passive play is like you can come here and no further. Because if the opponent continues to improve his position, eventually you will you will lose. But if you say you can only improve to this point, and this is where I, I, I put down my my defense, that, that's fortress thinking. And uh, I've, I've been thinking a lot about it also since the book. But what especially I, I realized was uh, even in some complex uh, bishop endings where there was um, no, no pawns, but just all these squares that if you get here, if you get here and here, then it wins. And if it doesn't get here, 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 doesn't win. 
um, I just found that it was fortresses, fortresses, and fortresses, the, the whole thinking. And usually when we talk about fortresses, we talk about our disposition as a fortress, where we mean that uh, it's a draw. You cannot improve your position. When I talk about a fortress, I'm talking about a, a specific way of trying to defend as a technique. Because for a practical player, um, yes, it's useful to, to think, does it hold or doesn't it hold? But sometimes uh, you'll go to the situation of, well, I just need to know how to put the pieces in the best way so I can, can prevent him from making advances so I make it difficult for him. We're not always uh, looking for the truth when we're, we're playing games. Um, by the way, one thing I was thinking about this end name, which uh, I will check later, uh, is whether or not uh, it would win for white with uh, the three points. And I think it should, but uh, it, it will need a, a check. Also, I wanted to check the ending uh, if we go back to uh, move 44, bishop g5. Uh, I think it's stronger. Root d4, f4. And okay, I, I, I was thinking this ending here. What if the, the rooks are exchanged? Is it winning? I would think it's just a dead draw, uh, but I want to check it, and, and I am checking it with uh, with a very nice program that you can download uh, on the internet for free, which is called Final Gen, which is uh, I think Spanish uh, the guy. So Final is Endgame, and Gen is for Generator. And as long as each side only have one piece, I think it can deal with nine or ten. Uh, bits on the board, uh, so that could be three pawns each and uh, a minor piece and a king. Uh, but the more pieces you put in, the longer it will take, and the more hard drive you need to to have a, a table base. So I'm I'm currently generating uh, the table base for without rooks, and afterwards I'm going to generate the one for the three pawns uh, against nothing. Uh, just just out of uh, interest, and uh, we'll add them to the PGN once it's done. Uh, so, Jacob, you think that uh, Magnus sa saying that he doesn't believe if, in fortresses? Do you believe that uh, this is might uh, this might be a weak spot in his uh, understanding? Or I don't think there are any weak spots in his understanding. <laughs> yes. I, th I, th I, th I think I think there's uh, there's plenty of weak spots in his character. Um, and, I, you know, you've seen it happen to a lot of people. They uh, work insanely hard to achieve their goals. And then afterwards, they're sort of lost. And I'm not, I, I don't want to say anything uh, negatively as a person, but as a player, he, he doesn't interest me much because he doesn't seem to really uh, appreciate chess at the moment. Um, he, he certainly hates uh, losing, but he doesn't seem to be very motivated to try winning. And I think that was the weak spot for this match. And uh, I, I always felt that uh, if they just, you know, if kayaking was just waiting, then at some point uh, Carlson would lose his patience because he, he does seem to be a very, very emotional uh, character. And uh, also, yeah, we, we can talk about match strategy and so on uh, at a later point because I know this is running a bit long. Um, but to me, the match has been been very interested. But then, uh, of course, I am currently British. And, uh, you know, that could change. I could move to another country or my country could leave Britain. Um, but one of our sports here is cricket, where uh, the deaths in as a commentator say, I don't want to bore you with the details. <laughs> Uh, because uh, just to explain it to our American friends, a cricket is like a boring version of baseball. And I have watched baseball games live, and they are they are uh, they have tedious parts. All Americans say that baseball is uh, is boring. So, but that's part of the experience. You know, you go with friends, you chat, you so on. You're not so interested in the game. Yeah. I have no idea about either sport, so no. no I, I, and I, you know, obviously now uh, Peter Sweetler will unfriend me on Facebook if you heard I said it's <laughs> boring. So yeah. So uh, in general, any 
any other comments uh, on the World Championship? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I still believe, and I've done for ever since I heard the suggestion uh, four years ago, I still believe that uh, playing the tie breaks before the match would be a good idea. Uh, I saw that uh, they put this, uh, Chess Base put this siren proposal uh, of 13 games uh, where the player with white in seven games, uh, or black in seven games would, would get the draw and the player with white would have to, to actually win the match. I think that's just an inferior version of playing the tie breaks first. Um, so, and he calls it a radical solution, which is, it's a slight tinkering with an existing idea. So, uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I wasn't very impressed by that. Um, what but, about, uh, what's your opinion also on game 12? There was a, uh, a debate with, uh, well, at one side, there was Nigel Short saying that this, this is not acceptable, I mean, game 12. And on the other side, there was uh, Daniel King at uh, Facebook, uh, who said that uh, players should not be interesting about the viewers, but they should be interesting, interested about winning the, the match. What is your opinion on that? Well, I think that the players uh, should uh, and should and will always represent their own interest, uh, which is not to um, uh, play according to gentleman rules, but uh, to play according to what is in their self-interest within the rules. Uh, if you want to change the player's behavior, you change the rules. Um, there was another proposal uh, somewhere by Khashim Janov, maybe it was also in chess base. Uh, of uh, having every day having a winner and uh, the thing is uh, I actually played a tournament like that where you know if it's a draw then you move on to um, to wrap it to wrap it and if it's a draw there you move on to blitz and then another blitz and so on and I played that and we were 10 players Danish championship 2006 and uh, in the first three rounds, I lost the first game. Then I lost the rapid two in a row. So I had zero out of three, and I was in last place. Then I made a draw with uh, Suneberg Hansen with black. At some point, he was winning. At some point, I was winning. Um, and I beat him in the rapid. So I got my, my first victory. I said, that's it. Now I'm going to win the tournament. And everyone laughed and said, yeah, of course you are. And then I won the next four games in the normal time control. And then in the last game, I was draw with white. And I held the rapid game, which was completely lost ending uh, with black. And then in a blitz game, I missed uh, a direct win, which if I'd won that, I would have won the tournament. Uh, instead, I was sixth place <laughs> because of a blitz game. And uh, no prize, of course. And uh, Suneberg Hansen uh, won the tournament. Uh, with six of these gladiator points, but also with six and a half uh, points in ordinary things. So he said the tournament system didn't work and uh, everyone else agreed, but I loved it. I really did. I, I, I thought this was very, uh, I thought this was a real uh, tough uh, way of playing chess. I thought it was, um, I thought it was very fascinating for the spectators. I thought it put a lot of pressure on the players. And I think everyone agreed on that it put a lot of pressure on the players. But I thought it was a good thing. Um, and then other people say, yeah, but you didn't have playoffs every day. And uh, I didn't because I actually put a lot of effort into my normal games. Um, so I think Hashim Dianov's suggestion is, uh, is worth more testing. Uh, it's been tried. And uh, it definitely was interesting to watch. And there were playoffs every day. And uh, the playoffs were fascinating. And I do think that uh, f finishing with a, a blitz game is a, is a very worthy way of, uh, of, of finishing a tournament. Uh, we might want to look a bit about how the tie breaks are going to be done. And there will be some, some adjustments and so on. But essentially, every day you have a winner, which is Khashim Diana's point. 
I think it's a, it's a very good idea. Uh, the system originally was uh, proposed to Danish Federation by Kurt Hansen, who watched the tournament from uh, the safety of his living room. <laughs> <laughs> Looked at the rest of us suffering. Um, so, so it's probably that. Uh, the players will just do whatever is in their self-interest. And, you know, if, if, if you somehow say they shouldn't do that, it's like uh, my, one of my favorite movie quotes of all time from Mission Impossible 3, where Lawrence Fishburne uh, says, uh, someone says, that's unfair. And he says, well, it's unfair that chocolate makes you fat, but I had my share and guess what? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, no, I, I play the players uh, cannot be uh, criticized for behaving according to the rules. Uh, you could also s criticize Carlson for uh, n waiting only 96 seconds or whatever it was at the press conference. On the other hand, it seemed he didn't care about uh, paying whatever fifty thousand dollars for for leaving. That, that didn't matter to him at all. Uh, Somehow I, I respect that. Uh, that 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 he cared more about the match and the outcome and so on about than money. Um, yeah, we we like human emotions. We don't like uh, robots. Right? No, th this is uh, you know my uh, my favorite sport for uh, for playing is tennis. Uh, I play tennis three four times a week, um, and. Uh, I really love playing and uh, I actually like watching it sometimes as well, but the players are so dull. They're so incredibly dull. You know, I grew up in the 80s and it was McEnroe and Connors. And uh, okay, Bjorn Bo was a bit bit stiff, but uh, he was only around for a very short while while I was uh, watching tennis. But Boris Becker and all these guys, they all had this emotion and all these things, but now they're all media trained because whenever they do anything that is slightly interesting, they lose sponsors. So, so they have all this media training and they're all these stiff characters. And uh, it, it's just not very interesting. Uh, you, you don't feel like you are caring if one player or the other wins. It's just like looking at the uh, games in a computer tournament, uh, chess games, a computer tournament, where you might think, yeah, that's a really, really fascinating game, really interesting position and all this kind of thing, and you can appreciate the game, but you would never really get emotionally engaged into it because you're not rooting for anyone. You don't care if uh, this program or that program wins. And if you do, um, you have your own issues. <laughs> You know you. <laughs> so, yeah. so no, I uh, I I think we have uh, great players, which uh, you know have very different personalities and are very interesting. And also, you see that for now, eight years we have had no conflicts in the World Championship. Yeah, we had no. There was no conflict in. Um, in Sofia, there was a little bit, you know, uh, a bit of teasing because uh, Anand couldn't get there because all flights were cancelled. But once they were there, everything was 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 very respectful and very well behaved. Uh, Twenty twelve match, girlfriend Anand, you couldn't imagine anything going wrong. You know, girlfriend would would greet Anand before each game backstage and says, "I'm glad to see you and let's have a good game," or something like this. Um, and of course, with with Carlson and uh, Anna and Kayak in uh, these matches, also there's been no conflict, no no controversy. So um, I, I I like this, but the, but they're not an emotional. Yeah, and I, th I think we need the Nakamura the World and the World Championship match or Giri. <laughs> well, you know the, the thing is, if you take a look at uh, Kayakim. Uh, has a very, very, very good sense of humor. Grischuk has an amazing, he's probably the funniest man in chess. He's got this very dry sense of humor, but he's so funny. You can you know, look up uh, some of some of the things he has uh, has said, you know. So funny. 
Um, you have uh, Kawana, who is also, you know, blossoming and, and becoming this really, really interesting, fascinating person. And uh, and he's at the the world championship all the time, and uh, you know he's talking to people and commenting, playing blitz with Lawrence Trent all the time, and uh, and and you know I think yeah, and I like Nakamura as well because he has this really strong desire, um, maybe stronger than his abilities, you know. Um, but in in general, I I think. The idea that somehow people shouldn't be allowed to say something, I think that is really yeah. That that's 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 really where you lose me because you remove all personality out of it. And of course, we had some debate based on uh, on uh, the vlog we did on uh, a, f a few weeks ago on the website, where I was criticizing for using a word I will not reuse, but it was um, it was slightly rude. It was not very rude, but it was slightly rude. And uh, the, this criticism was was partly using that word, but mainly the fact that I was criticizing another author's book, and I shouldn't be allowed to do that because I'm write myself, not publisher myself. And and to me, this is this is the kind of thing when um, when people are saying they're tired of political correctness. Is this kind of thing where you say something which is obviously true, but you shouldn't say it? Yeah. I don't think people are, uh, are tired of, uh, you know, the the disappearing of the word of Nico if we ex exclude rap music. I'm, I'm sorry I used it if it offend anyone, but I'm using it just as an example. Um, I don't think people uh, want to be able to use this kind of thing on this way of talking about people uh, again. Um, but for example, uh, we had this US election where uh, one person was uh, the president-elect was was characterized as this racist woman hating this and that and so on so uh, all the time and I, w I was guilty of it too uh, I because I, I think what he wants to do politically is horrible and I I fell for for the temptation as well of criticizing and I've, I've been thinking about it and um, I still worried about what he will do politically and and we can take that debate on facebook quality chess doesn't have any any uh, political views um but the thing is they took his behavior towards individuals as being general uh, hate towards a group like he was talking about illegal immigrants and some of them uh were good people and some of them were not and says he's racist about Mexicans when what he was talking about was illegal immigration. He was mocking a, a reporter who happened to be disabled that he mocked him for his disability. But does that mean that he hates disabled people? No, it doesn't. It means just that he's not a very, uh, very skilled debater and he, he doesn't express himself very kindly. Um, Certainly, it's not impressive behavior, but 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 is it uh, racism or, or sexism and these things? I don't think it is. And I think when uh, when you're not allowed to to say things that are true, then then you get to the real problem. And if idiots are not allowed to be idiots, we also have a problem, especially you and me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. last... uh, we, we, this, we, 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 uh, we ran a bit over time here, so let's finish up. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe next week it will be just you and a guest. What do you think? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. We have many ideas and uh, we will see. And um, hopefully we, we will have uh, a new champion or an old champion to talk about. No, no, we will definitely have a new champion. This is the thing. This is one thing that people don't understand. Uh, sorry, we, we're gonna. I'm gonna go on about this a, a bit more after all. Um, in 2006, the match between Tupalov and Kramnik. They, you could even say already 2005, where the, the, at a point where Fide didn't really have a champion. They have Khashimjanov, but okay. But still, 2005 in St. Louis, 2006 match in Elista. You see, in these matches, you have a, a new uh, tournament of matches. You have a new concept, which actually you can, in FIDE, take back all the way to 97. 
and uh, the Groningen uh, with the Zurich World Championship. The fact that the world champion doesn't have draw odds anymore. And that is a conceptual change. The world champion no longer defends his title, he wins it. And if you look at Anand's uh, language about the world championship over the years, you will very clearly say, see that he said, I have won the world championship in this, this, and this format. He, he, his match against uh, Kramnik in 2008, you can find uh, probably uh, incidents where I talk about defending the title, but you can definitely also find instances where he talks about winning the title. So he's won it in tournament, he won it in uh, knockout, he won it in matches, but he always talks about winning it. And for that reason, whatever happens tonight, we'll have a new champion, and it might be the same champion, but we'll have a new champion anyway. Okay. Words matter. Okay, let's cut. Yeah.